Okay, welcome everyone. This is uh, the Aquarium of Pacific, Pacific's uh, first Wednesday, and I'm Peter Kriva, the CEO and President, and I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker to you and just want to remind you that after the talk, we have the robot lounge out there where you can mingle with and socialize with the different robots. I grew up on Jetsons, so this is a big deal night for me. Professor Sue caught me uh, is a professor of computer science and electrical and computer engineering at USC. He's really been a leader and developer of the robotic technology. Um, what strikes me is I, I always look up, I watch one of his videos, and he's some robots are serious things, but they're also very fun things. And he is able to share the seriousness and the, the technological promise of it, and also share some of the fun of it. Um, you know, it's going to be a big deal for oceans. If we haven't even mapped the ocean floor yet, uh, robots would help a lot with that. And think about the oil spill right now. Robots and under, you know, unmanned submersibles, those would be key to finding out information about it. They're so important to ocean. And with that, I look forward to, this, to the talk. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, it's really a pleasure to be speaking here as part of this series um, in this spectacular theater. Um, I could never get over the screen. Um, so uh, as Peter said, I've been working on uh, robots for uh, aquatic applications for quite a while now. And it's one of the areas my lab focuses on at USC. And what I'd like to do today is to give you a little bit of a sense for the kind of work we do. And I think it's quite representative of some of the, some of the uh, advances being made in underwater robotics today. And uh, hopefully sets the stage for a broader set, set of questions about where the field is going and what, what we can expect from the field um, in the future. So I'd like, to, I'd like to begin just by sort of casting the problem uh, more broadly than robotics. Um, so, you know, Peter alluded to this, that sometimes we forget that we live on what is essentially the, the water planet. So, you know, life uh, on Earth began in the water, and, uh, you know, a substantial portion of the Earth's surface is covered by water, and uh, what you may not know or may know is that half the oxygen produced on Earth is produced in the water. And virtually all habitable space on Earth is in the ocean. Now, of course, some of us conflate habitable with human habitable. Um, I don't necessarily mean human habitable, but habitable for life. And so the, the ocean is a fundamental driver of everything that happens on our planet. And it is so substantially important for almost every facet of human life and of life in general on the planet that it is really not a, not a stretch to say that we live on, on a water planet. Um, now, uh, as Peter said, you know, we know very little about the ocean. Even though we live on a water planet, uh, just, to, just to sort of give one example, only 20% of the ocean bottom has been mapped compared to 100% of the Martian surface. Right? And uh, Mars is a little smaller than Earth, though in this picture they, they look roughly the same size. But it is, it is quite amazing to realize that we have fairly accurate ma maps of the surface of Mars, but we've only mapped a fifth of the ocean bottom, right? which is literally right out there. Um, now, you can imagine there are substantial challenges to mapping the ocean bottom, um, and, and robotics is making some advances along this line, but there is substantially more to the ocean than only mapping the bottom. There are many things to be learned as a consequence of studying the ocean. And so robots can play a really central role in this discovery, in this journey, in being useful for applications um, that develop a better relationship between us and the ocean. And it turns out that we've been building ocean robots for a long time. 
Um, you know, I'm showing here a few pictures of ocean robots that have been built over the last two decades, two to three decades. But of course, the story of ocean robotics goes way back much earlier than that. Humans have been building devices which are in some sense robotic for much longer than that to go down into the water. And some of those devices have been submersibles, so they're meant to take people down into the water. Others are remote controlled, remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. And still others in the modern context are vehicles like this, which are really designed to be let loose in the ocean and powered by computers and modern computing, artificial intelligence and machine learning can make decisions for themselves and do some useful work for us in the process. So this is where, this is where a lot of uh, substantial amounts of modern developments in underwater robotics are happening. Um, sometimes when I show this slide, people say, well, there's one thing they all have in common. They, uh, there are different sizes, different shapes. Um, clearly, some are built for the deep sea and some are not. But the one thing they have in common is they're all yellow. And I, I do concede that a substantial number of underwater robots are yellow. Not every last one, but a substantial number. Just makes them that much easier to recover when you go out on the boat and the robot is bobbing up and down there. All right, so having said that, how can, how can robots help? What, what can robots do for us underwater? I couldn't make an exhaustive list. It would be too big. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to list some examples here. Um, one thing robots can help us do underwater is the column on the right, which is really further our understanding of the ocean. They can help chemists and biologists who study the biochemistry of the ocean by taking the right kinds of water samples. They can help uh, physicists who study how ocean phenomena like ocean waves are created in studying the dynamics of the ocean. They can help with weather forecasting because so much of our weather is driven by what's happening in the ocean. They can help with ecology. You know, there are complex food chains in the ocean and, and microbial communities. To discover those structures requires analysis and requires exploration of the ocean. It requires particularly persistent exploration of the ocean, the ability to stay in the ocean for very long periods of time and make time series measurements of what is going on. But it also requires fantastic spatial resolution, the ability to measure at different places over a period of time. And so, so it could fundamentally alter how we think about ecology in the ocean. And interestingly, um, robots can even help with seismology uh, by studying what's happening at the bottom, bottom of the ocean where, where tectonic activity can be measured. Um, on the, on the left, I've listed a variety of applications. You could imagine using underwater robots for building structures underwater, pylons to, to, to support bridges, for example. You can imagine robots being used for defense underwater um, or for better uh, fisheries. Um, you can also imagine underwater robots for mining in the future um, or for shipping or even doing archaeology, discovering shipwrecks, understanding why certain things happen um, imaging them, reconstructing what happened in the past. And so there are a variety of interesting applications. And this is by no means uh, an exhaustive list. So what I'd like to do today is to tell you about a few vignettes of activity that have happened in my laboratory over the last 15 odd years that span some of these areas. Uh, you know, my lab is active in helping and collaborating with scientists who study the biology and ecology of, of uh, plankton communities in the ocean, also with some seismologists. And we've also done some work on applying underwater robotics technology to applications in defense and underwater structure inspection and shipping. So I'll focus on these. And you can think of each of these vignettes as a little story, which boils down our research into a few key ideas to just illustrate where this frontier is. Um, and there are so many applications that you could have one of my colleagues who works in underwater robotics give you a talk with four other vignettes. There's just an endless set of applications. So I've, I've picked the four that I've really enjoyed working on over the last 15 years to give you a sense of, of where the field is. Now, before I tell you about, um, about these, these four stories, I, I want to set the stage by telling you a little bit about one of the underwater robots we use in our laboratory, and it's in common use 
across many research groups in the world. And so what the video shows is a underwater robot. And uh, the first thing to note is that the robot is on a tether. And the only reason it's on a tether is because my graduate student is, is swimming alongside it, filming it. Normally, when we do experiments, of course, the robot is untethered and free to roam the ocean. Now, this particular kind of robot is called an underwater glider. And it's a very popular kind of underwater robot that is used extensively um, in oceanography to study the ocean. And we have, over the past 15 to 20 years, successfully deployed these kinds of machines extensively right out here in the Southern California Bight over many, many weeks at a time. So how does a machine like this work? It's a, it's a really interesting machine because a, you know, one of the things when you look at it moving through the water, you realize is it doesn't seem to have a propeller. It doesn't seem to have any evident means of propulsion that moves it through the water. Um, so the way it works is it's a beautifully designed device that has the ability to control its own buoyancy. Now, as you all know, if something is positively buoyant, it rises in the water. And if something is negatively buoyant, it sinks in the water. And so if you can have a device that can control its buoyancy, this device can control whether it's going up or whether it's going down. And that's the basic principle. Now, of course, if that's all the device could do, then what would happen is it would sit in more or less one place and just bob up and down, which is a useful property to have, but it's not quite make it a glider. What these machines have, in addition to controlled buoyancy, are foils or wings, which allow the vehicle to convert its motion as it's falling by pointing the wings in the appropriate direction into a forward motion. And so the way this vehicle works is as it falls, it also moves forward. It then reverses its buoyancy, and as it goes up, it continues to move forward. With this combination of changing its buoyancy and using the foils or the wings, this robot is able to both bob up and down and generate forward motion. Most vehicles like this also have a mass inside them, usually the battery, which you can move forward or back using a little motor. And that changes the pitch of the robot. So if you make the nose heavier, the robot pitches down. If you make the nose lighter by moving the mass back, the robot pitches up. So those are the hidden engines, if you will, that you don't see clearly that essentially cause the motion that you're seeing. And it generates a very particular kind of motion, which is shown on the right. Um, what you see on the right here is this kind of plot. And this is typically called a curtain plot, where the trajectory is the trajectory of this glider. And you can see it's sort of bobbing up and down while moving forward. It generates turns because it does have a rudder. And so it's able to move along a particular direction all the while going up and down. And it's able to move along another direction all the while going up and down. And that's the kind of motion this thing generates. So it's a buoyancy-driven machine. Now, a, a robot like this has sensors on it. And there are two kinds of sensors, primarily. One set of sensors are really sensors that measure properties of the water, uh, something about the water chemistry, something about the physical properties of the water, dissolved nutrients, things like the pressure, things like the temperature, things like the salinity. So there's a standard suite of instruments, typically in the nose cone, that measures several water properties. The other set of sensors that a vehicle like this has are guidance and navigation sensors, which are sensors that allow the robot to track its position. So it has gyroscopes on it, a compass that allow it to dead reckon its way when it's underwater. It also has a GPS, which it can use when it surfaces. So the GPS doesn't work underwater, but the robot does have access to a GPS fix every time it comes up to the surface. So it also has you know, a clock to keep, keep track of time and a few other things. And so if you look closely at this curtain plot, what you'll see is that it's color coded that some parts of this plot are, are you know, red or yellow. And those signal areas where the glider is measuring high concentrations of chlorophyll, which in turn signals that that's where there's a lot of microbial life. And there are other parts where it's measuring virtually none. 
And so as you fly these transects, and I use the word fly because this is effectively an underwater drone, as you fly through the water in this buoyancy-driven manner, you get a cross-section of a variety of measurements about the water. And by piecing these together, you can form a synoptic picture of what the ocean in that region is doing. And uh, there, are, there are different kinds of gliders, and they operate on slightly different principles, but basically this is how they, they work. The glider that uh, we work with in our laboratory can potentially go as deep as 1,000 meters. So it's a substantially mechanically hardened platform that's designed not quite for the deep ocean, but still substantially uh, deep water. We typically tend to operate in the upper column of the water for most of the work we do, but many of these gliders are rated at anywhere between 200 to 1,000 meters. So one of the things to note about gliders in particular is that they're high endurance machines. So this is a picture of a very famous glider traversal done by, done by colleagues at Rutgers University. They launched a glider um, off the eastern coast of the United States and told it to go all the way over to Spain. And it took, it took the robot more than 200 days to do this, but it made it. And that's an example of what a high endurance machine can do. As you can probably guess, it's a very slow moving machine, often traversing no more than about a mile per hour. So it's not designed for speed, but it is designed for persistence, endurance, and really staying in the ocean for long periods of time, allowing us to make allowing us to make measurements over really long time scales, substantial time scales. Right? So now I want to tell you about these sort of four stories about some of the projects that we've been doing in the lab. And I picked the first one as a, as a, as, you know, in the spirit that we're all Angelinos here and the bane of our existence often is traffic. We, we complain about it endlessly and it's just a fact of life in Southern California. So you might ask, what does this have to do with gliders? I don't see any water around and I don't see any robots around and what does traffic have to do with underwater robots? Well, here's an overhead picture of our region of the ocean. This is the port of LA and Long Beach. There's Huntington Beach down here um, and then there's Newport way down here. What these little dots are, are ships. The container ships waiting for birth in the port. And there's quite a substantial traffic jam of these ships. And I actually took this picture from an article in the Washington Post just last month. And some of you who've gazed out over the ocean, you've probably seen how many ships that are waiting are waiting to get into port. That's quite the traffic jam. Right? Now, it's a traffic jam, at least in marine terminology. So, you know, when you, when you send a robot to do a traverse like this, it turns out that one of the most hazardous places to be is right here. That's where, that's where you get all the traffic jams from the ships or, you know, at the other end. So if you're an underwater roboticist in LA, one of the problems you work on right away is keep your robot out of trouble. You don't want your robot to come into contact with one of these. For one thing, your robot is toast. And for another thing, it's a really, really bad idea um, for maritime operations, for anything like that to happen. Um, so what we did is we looked at a collection of data about how the Port of LA is used by ship traffic, going back over multiple years. And based on that, we built uh, a map like this. This map is basically a, a map that for every pixel color codes the probability that a robot would collide with a ship if it was to unexpectedly surface at that point. As long as these robots are in, you know, below the level of a ship's hull, they're fine. But from time to time, they must come up for a GPS fix or to send information back to shore. When that happens, they are at most risk. And so this is what roboticists call a risk map. Red means areas of very high risk. Yellow means slightly lower. White means even less. 
and blue means there's virtually no risk. And you can see that the risk map really nicely segments along the, along the lanes of ship traffic that approach the port. Um, here's Catalina Island, and so there's also some regular activity to and from the mainland to Catalina. This is a risk map built from data, from real data of ship traffic in, 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 the, in the vicinity of, of the port of LA. Now, we have this risk map, so let's look a little bit at what happens when we try to get one of our gliders to explore this region. So uh, this movie is gonna play in the background, and uh, what I want you to focus on is the robot was told to start at this point. This is where we dropped it off in the ocean. And it was told to go to this goal location. Catalina Island is way down here. You can barely see it in the dark. Um, and, the, and the harbor is up here. You can see the main ship traffic headed to the harbor. And, and you can see that uh, I've drawn the kind of the ship traffic, the, the sort of hazard map for you um, in the background. And you know, we thought we were being pretty clever. We had, these, we had these areas that we knew the robot had to avoid. And so we programmed the robot to surface at these waypoints that are labeled W. So W2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through 7. And we picked them so that they're, they're in areas of low risk, so that the robot would come up to get a GPS fix and to communicate back to us in areas that were not risky. But if you observe what this picture is showing, it's showing something different happening. You can see that when the robot thinks it's at six, it actually surfaces over here. Or when the robot thinks it's at seven, it actually surfaces right over here. Um, you'll see this very dramatically when it thinks it's at four, and you'll see what happens. When it's underwater, it thinks it's headed to four, but when it pops up, the GPS tells it it's actually surfaced right in the middle of your shipping lane, right? And the reason this happens is, is really twofold. One is when the robot is underwater, it can only dead reckon its way. And so there's a certain amount of drift in how well it can reckon its position. It doesn't have access to GPS. The second is that the robot's making no computations of the ocean currents affecting its movement. It's making dead reckoning computations as though the ocean is sitting still. It doesn't, have, it doesn't have any access to ocean measurements that allow us to correct for the effect of the ocean pushing it along. And so invariably, when it surfaces, it surfaces at locations um, that are not particularly healthy. Right? And so what we did was we worked with some colleagues at, uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who specialize in building models of the ocean. And so the model up here, labeled ROMS, is a, region ocean, a regional ocean model. And it produces basically a weather forecast for the ocean. It tells you how a patch of water in the ocean is going to move over the next 6 to 12 to 24 hours. So you can think of it as sort of weather forecasting for the ocean. And there are various groups all over the world that specialize in this. Um, and, and these colleagues uh, produced this map. Now, what we did was to consume this map and build a mathematical model that allowed us to come up with what roboticists call a policy. A policy is a fancy way of saying that for every place in the ocean, we can pre-compute what the robot needs to do over the next four to six hours to correct for the effect of the ocean. But of course, these corrections have to be constantly updated because the ocean is changing over time. So as fast as you can produce a forecast for what the ocean is gonna do, we can run a model that effectively compensates. So if the robot finds itself in any area within this sort of Southern California bite, we have, in effect, a solution for what it needs to do to compensate. And this computation is tantamount to solving um, what is an artificial intelligence called a Markov decision process. Um, and we can efficiently solve this for very large kinds of problems. And there are some interesting mathematical intricacies on how this is done and how these models feed into it. And I've left those out for now, but the basic idea is 
that if you have a forecast of what the ocean currents are going to do, it is possible to work with that forecast to produce compensatory effects so that the robot is able to stay out of trouble. And so we were able to do this. And here's a video of our robot navigating in the same sort of dense, densely trafficked area. And you can see that the robot in red is the robot that's enacting the policy. You can see that it really is good at hitting the waypoints. It's really good at hitting all the waypoints. It never surfaces in the middle of traffic. And it's able to navigate safely to the goal. Now, the way this is actually done is what's happening under the hood is because we have a model of how to react to the ocean currents, instead of the robot being commanded to the actual waypoint I want it to go to, the robot computes what it calls a pseudo waypoint. In other words, it aims for a different location, and it knows that the compensation model will actually take it to the correct place. And that's the, that's the gist of what's happening under the hood. Now, there are, there are a fair number of complexities hiding behind this, but, but basically, when you boil it down, that's what we're able to do. And we're able to do this quite reliably, quite robustly, so that we can actually do persistent experiments in the Southern California Bay. Without this, we would not have dared to spend you know, days and weeks doing experiments in the bite because we wouldn't be sure that we were operating in a safe manner. So it's a basic capability that we needed to build. Um, and this is sort of a technological effort that really increases our ability, it increases the utility of this robot in areas with crowded ship traffic. Okay. So that's my first vignette. It sort of is a, if you will, a robotics first vignette. It's a roboticist view of a robot that had some capabilities and our ability to enhance those capabilities and build something new out of it so that it lays the foundation for safe operations and doing other things. So now let me tell you about some other things we can do. Right? Um, my second vignette for you is, is a very different kind of story. Uh, some of you in the audience are old enough to probably remember what this is. This is a picture of the USS Cole. And the USS Cole was a, a Navy vessel um, that was attacked while it was in a foreign harbor some time ago. And so vehicles like this, vessels like this, are particularly vulnerable when they are in, in harbor because it is possible, as happened in this case, for somebody to pull up alongside and, and set off an explosive that can, that can severely damage a, a vessel like this. And this accident, or this, this uh, um, this attack led to severe loss of life and was a fairly serious event for, for, a, for a vessel this capable. Now, inspired by sort of problems like this, we set about thinking, can you use underwater robots to act as sentries to protect underwater structures? Is it possible, you know, this problem of damage to an underwater structure doesn't just happen above the water level, it can also happen underneath the water line. Is it possible to design a robot that's entrusted with keeping a, a vessel like this safe? Now, I don't know how visible it is, but this is, a, this is a ship that's berthed, and you can see very faintly here underwater is a, is a robot. And so the idea is, we know something about what the the hull looks like. We know the geometry of the hull. Can you patrol it constantly so that if there's some change to the geometry of the hull, maybe because somebody stuck something onto it, is it possible for the robot to make that change, to detect that change effectively? Right? Now, you might think, well, you know, why not just keep patrolling and taking pictures and send the pictures back and, and we can see. But what we want is the ability to do this as automatically as possible. We want the robot to be able to do this on the fly without having a human look at the pictures. And second, we want to give some mathematical guarantee that our technique is in some way efficient, meaning that for a given robot, you could not do better, that we've somehow figured out the best way to orbit the ship so that if somebody tinkered with the hull, we've put ourselves in the best position to discover it. That's the kind of problem a computer scientist or a roboticist likes to solve with a, with a robot like this. And so we pose the problem in the following way. 
And so I have a little uh, pop quiz for all of you. At the bottom are five images. The way the robot scans the hull of the ship is using, is using sonar. So it has a device called an imaging sonar. And many of you have seen sonar scans. They're typically used underwater. They're also used to look inside the human body. And they produce images that look like this, which honestly I've never found easy to understand or interpret. Uh, some people tell me they can, and I really can't. But in any case, so here's the, here's the quiz. What I'm telling you is that these are imaging sonar scans, and I'm asking you which of these contains an explosive device that's placed on the hull. Any guesses? So I hear some shouts for B, which would probably be the one I would guess too. Any, any, any people who think it's not B and willing to put some money on something else? I hear some shouts for A. Okay. And somebody here, somebody here caught it. This is a trick question. The answer is that the explosive device is in all of them. Okay. But what the slide illustrates is that it is just easier to see from some views. Okay. Now, notice I'm thinking of very small devices, not, not a giant disruption to the structure. This opens up the problem for the kind of solution that I suggested to you earlier. It is really a problem of putting the robot in the right place at the right viewing angle so that the detection probability is as high as possible. And that's the core problem. If you had imaging sonar that could falselessly detect this kind of tampering from any position or any angle, well, that wouldn't be, any, that wouldn't be a difficult problem. You'd, you'd just get the robot to circle the ship as fast as it could. But it turns out that these kinds of devices, these kinds of imagers, are very sensitive to the viewing pose and the viewing angle. And so what we did is we built a technique based on machine learning that predicts which scans are the best to identify uh, the presence of some sort of tampering. And based on this, we were able to reduce the number of views the robot needs to take by up to 80%. And that's where the speed up comes from. So if the robot just sort of naively took scan after scan, you'd probably discover where the tampering had happened, but we can do it with 80% fewer views, and therefore we can do it significantly faster than a technique that doesn't have the sparks built in. And so what does our algorithm do? It looks at the scan and it scores it. So it's, it's, my algorithm is telling me that this scan has a high score and this scan has a low score. And so based on this scoring mechanism, what we can do is we can construct what's called a graph. And this graph, each, each little vertex on this graph is a viewing position. So we can pick the best viewing positions and connect them up in the form of a little tour that the robot has to take um, around the structure. And I'm showing you a couple of undersides of ships here. This is the propeller and the rudder assembly here in the back. So it's a complicated geometry where some areas have high curvature, where it's easy to disguise and, and tamper with. And so what our techniques find are areas where it's important for the robot to be more frequently and areas where it's okay to have a bigger standoff distance. We can connect these up and we can sequence them um, using some techniques from robotic path planning to generate the sequence of good views and then generate a path for the robot to follow that keeps the tamper detection probability high. And this is a, an example of how underwater robotics can do underwater inspection. It's not particular to ships. Um, any kind of underwater structure supports for bridges, for example, any underwater truss structure that you might, you might you know, be interested in protecting, things like this. Okay. So that was my second vignette, is the ability to use underwater robots as sensors that can smartly position themselves without a human operator driving them around. There's nobody at the joystick. Okay. My third vignette is, is, uh, is yet a sort of a different um, kind of application. So this is a picture um, 
of a seismic array that's been laid on the ocean floor off the western coast of the United States. And these kinds of uh, ocean observing arrays, these kinds of arrays that are used to uh, detect plate tectonics and make various measurements at the bottom of the ocean are really expanding our understanding of what the bottom of the ocean looks like and how, how the geology underneath there is changing and gives us some sense a better model or a better understanding of how plate tectonics is, is, is actually working. Now, one of the challenges for these kinds of observing systems at the bottom of the ocean is that they typically tend to be cabled. You run a large cable out to them to get data back from them because they're often in the very deep ocean. Now, there have been efforts to put seismic sensors, seismometers, at the bottom of the ocean which don't have any cabling. And they do exist. But if you want to have a dense array of such seismometers at the bottom of the ocean, then what you really want is for those devices to be able to log data, which is what they do. And then every now and then, you want the device to be able to send you all the data that it's logged, preferably when it detects a, a, an event of some sort, or maybe periodically. And one way to get that data off these devices is to have a robot fly by, an underwater robot fly by, which can acoustically communicate with the device, exfiltrate data from it, and then the robot comes back to shore with all the data. And so this is an application of using an underwater robot as, as a data mule, in effect, a device for ferrying data. Right? It's an odd way to think about robots. We think of robots as moving mass around, not particularly for moving bits around. This is an example to get bits of information from an inaccessible place to us by mechanically going there, exfiltrating the data, and literally driving back with the data. Okay. And we don't often in day-to-day -day life think about moving data like that. But, but, but it, it's, a, it's an interesting application driven by, driven by how remote the bottom of the ocean is. And so, so we worked on this problem. And so the data transfer between the robot and one of these sensors is by acoustic communication. And the question is, what path should the robot follow? How should it, how should it go from one sensor to the next? Um, and it turns out that if you want to plan good paths, efficient paths, then you need a good model of the communication, the acoustic communication between the robot and the sensors underwater. So together with some colleagues who specialize in building such models, we worked on this problem. And what these models produce is a picture like this. If the robot is at a particular location, it might have sort of moderate connectivity acoustically to some sensors. It might have very poor connectivity to other sensors. It might have very good connectivity to some other sensors. So a good acoustic model gives us a handle on which sensors the robot has good connectivity to it based on where it is. Using this model, we are able to design what computer scientists call an efficient tour for the robot. So you have this sort of sensor field that's sitting at the bottom of the ocean. And what I'm showing here is the robot going from sensor to sensor. And every time it collects data from the sensor, the color of the sensor changes. And you can see over time, it ends up visiting all of them. Now, you might think that this is a, seems like, at first sight, a fairly easy problem. I mean, if you know where all the sensors are, why not just go to each one in sequence and get the data from them? But it turns out that you know, being a pesky computer scientist, I want the most efficient tour. I want the robot to travel as short a distance as possible while getting the data from all the sensors. Right? And this is a very old problem in computer science. It goes under the name of the traveling salesperson problem because when it was originally posed more than 50 years ago, the way it was posed was if you're a salesperson and you want to go from city to city and you want to visit each city once and then return back to your home city, what's the path you should take so that the path is shortest? So don't just line up the cities in some order and then go from one to the other. Find me the path that overall is going to be the shortest. And it turns out that this problem that is so easy to state is actually fiendishly difficult to solve if you have more than just a few cities. 
In fact, it's a computationally difficult problem. And so our problem is a variant of that problem because what we have are these regions the robot has to visit, not quite particular points. And the regions have some characteristics to them because the communication fades as the robot approaches the sensor within a region. So we have a slightly different variant of this traveling salesperson problem. And it turns out that an exact solution to this problem is unobtainable, but a very, very good approximate solution is obtainable. And what we were able to show mathematically is that we can produce such a solution. And it's good enough that actually when you eyeball the results, you really can't tell that it's approximate in any sense. Um, you'll have to take my word for it. And so that's another example of how underwater robotics can be used to really help, um, help a scientist who's fundamentally trying to study plate tectonics. And there's an interesting problem that is interesting to a computer scientist and roboticist that emerges from this application. It's a very practical use case, but the underlying science you have to do is quite complicated. I'd like to tell you one last story, which is yet another application that we've worked on, yet another area where we think underwater robots can make a difference. And so this is the area of using underwater robots to study microbial ecology is to use robots deployed in the ocean so that people who study microbial life in the ocean can make advances in their understanding of how that life functions. So what I'm showing you here are a sequence of pictures taken from a satellite. Um, this is the Monterey Bay uh, in Northern California. And I'm showing you pictures from the 19th of September to the 8th of October of Monterey Bay taken from a satellite. And the color indicates, you know, blue is water with no chlorophyll in it. Um, the sort of yellow red is high areas of chlorophyll. And so you might, you might think that if there's an alga bloom of some sort, it would look like this. And then over time, that bloom would advect and move around and, you know, really flare up again in certain areas. And so it's a very dynamic picture as this alga bloom is, is, um, is, um, increasing in intensity and also being advected around by the ocean. And so it's a very sort of dynamic setting. Now, you've probably all seen pictures of, of an algal bloom or you have seen one firsthand. Here's a picture from NASA off, off the coast of Florida where you can see the water is really stained because of the presence of, um, because of, the presence of, 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 of a red tide. And sometimes you'll see beach closure notices saying, don't, don't go in the water, it's unsafe to be in the water. Um, this picture here is a large fish kill that happened just here in Southern California a few years ago when there was a bloom offshore um, which, which resulted in the emission of toxin into the water. The toxin uh, is particularly harmful to fish and confuses their ability to navigate, um, acts on their brains in, 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 in ways that makes it difficult for them to navigate. And they typically end up, or often end up, in a harbor, which then becomes anoxic because there's not enough oxygen for that many fish. The fish don't know how to get out of the harbor. More of them come in, and over time, they, they perish, simply because the water becomes anoxic. There are other toxins which, of course, more directly also kill marine life. And so some of these, Microbial blooms are of tremendous practical significance because they have serious impacts on other forms of life. We would like to understand why they happen. We'd like to study the presence of these microbes, understand something about their community structure. And really, I think robots can be a fascinating tool for, for, for scientists who work in this field. And so we work very closely with scientists who study this to study this problem. And we studied one particular facet of this problem. This was joint work with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and we actually used their robot for this. This is the Dorado robot from Embari. This is, up here is a picture of the, um, the bathymetry, the underwater topography off the coast of Monterey, and there's a very sharp, steep canyon up there. And so there's a very interesting set of sort of places underwater to visit and explore 
and, and, and Laurie, of course, has spent a very long amount of time studying this area. In our collaboration with them, we made use of this vehicle's ability to, to scoop up water samples. And so what is shown here are a bunch of these syringes. And what this robot can do is when it reaches this area where it thinks a sample ought to be taken, it can draw water in to one of these syringes. And then when it's finished its tour, it can come back and we can recover these water samples and analyze them in the lab. Now, one of the things to note is that there's only a limited number of these syringes, typically 10 odd. And once you take a water sample, you've used up that syringe. So it's not really an option to take a sample, realize five seconds later that you made a mistake, squirt it out, and take another sample, because you contaminated the syringe. So it's really a one-shot deal. And unlike many other areas of computer science or robotics where sampling is done by taking pictures, and with modern cameras and modern disks, you can take virtually infinite pictures. Well, not quite infinite, but you can take thousands of pictures, millions of pictures. This kind of sampling, physical sampling, is still fundamentally limited by how many you can have. You can build a bigger robot and take 100, if you like. But if the robot's going to stay out there for days and weeks, it's still not a large number. You have to choose judiciously. So that's one constraint that's, that's present. Right? Now, what do we want to sample for? You, know, you can sample for many things. Our colleagues were interested in developing a technique, or for us to develop a technique, that was good at producing samples where there is a particular kind of plankton that would be present in high abundance. So this is a picture of abundance versus different types of plankton. And we want to take a water sample, which is going to be high abundance for one kind of plankton and relatively low abundance for the other. Right? We don't just want to go get some water and find that there's a bunch of different plankton in there. We already knew that without going out. We want to do intelligent sampling. And the robot gets to go out and take 10 of these and has to choose judiciously. And I want it to return hot for one particular type of plankton. Right? Now, if the robot could write in the water, if it had a sophisticated assay so that it could make measurements of the water that told it which plankton type it was, if it could directly measure the biology, then maybe this would be realistic, easier to do. But in fact, what the robot does, it, is only, measures the, it only measures the chemistry and physics of the ocean as it's moving along and it has to make predictions of the likely biology in the vicinity. And so what we did was based on some data that had been collected in the past, we again built a machine learning model that predicted organism abundance in real time based on what the robot was measuring. So as it was moving through the ocean, it was running a real time predictor of what the likely biological co co composition there looked like of, 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 of the plankton community. And so what you see on top here is the robot zigzagging up and down, like I told you these robots do. And I false colored it with, with sort of the yellow and the red showing where most of the chlorophyll is. And so you can see most of the chlorophyll is at about you know, 10 meters of depth, about 30 feet down, all the way maybe down in some cases to about 60 feet down. This is not surprising because most of these microbes trade off the sunlight that comes from the top and the nutrients that come from the bottom. And for microbial life, this is a very sophisticated piece of life that actually can trade this off just right so it gets enough sunlight from the top and enough nutrients from the bottom to make its living in this layer. And they even bob up and down as the sun goes down and as the sun comes up. So it's a very, 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 very sophisticated mechanism. Now, what our robot does is it sort of cycles up and down, and these black crosses are places the robot picks and decides to take samples at. And it turns out that this is a difficult problem because you, wanna, you don't want to take all your samples early because then when you arrive in an area that's really hot, you have no canisters left. You don't want to delay till the end and then realize there's nothing good to sample. So there's a whole mathematical area underlying this called optimal stopping theory. And, and we used some of the tools from that to design this sampling algorithm. 
We also designed it so that at least one sample would be taken in an area that is not hot. Because you don't want to do an experiment where you go out and all the samples are hot for the species and you declare success. But maybe that day the whole ocean was hot for that species and you didn't learn anything. So you, you do need to take one sample that's not. So the, the technique we developed will, will pick one area where it commits is not going to be hot. And the takeaway from this is that we were successful in returning to the lab with water samples that were hot for this one species. It's a very useful tool to be able to have, to be able to go out and say, bring me that microbe. Okay. And this is a proof principle. It, it, it takes a lot of work to operationalize this and generalize this. But it's a, it's a very good first proof principle that this can be done. All right. So I think my time is nearly up, so I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, you know, I, I, my, my goal was to give you a few examples of the way we've used underwater robots and we've contributed to underwater robotic technology over the last few years um, in order to facilitate discoveries in science, but also for practical applications. And uh, these are just examples from my laboratory. There are many other examples and many other creative ways in which people have used underwater robots. There's just a plethora of ways in which you can use these machines and make them better. Um, like I said, this is not even an exhaustive list. And so, you know, 100, 100 plus years ago, exploring the ocean meant throwing a net over the surface and returning back to shore with it. Right? And that, that was primarily what, what, what used to happen. We've come a very long way. The picture on the right is the Alvin submersible. It is a vehicle very unlike what the vehicles I work with. This is a deep sea submersible. It goes to the very bottom of the deep ocean more than 4,000 meters deep, incredibly sophisticated, carries two people inside it. Um, but there is a far cry. I mean, we've come a really, really long way. But I always like to say, you know, with apologies to Richard Feynman, who said this in a completely different context, I like say there's plenty of room at the bottom. I mean, the, 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 the world below the waterline is really open territory for exploration. Feynman said this in the context of very small scales, and it's used as an inspiration for nanotechnology, I'm borrowing it liberally and literally to literally mean there's a lot to do below the waterline. And so I'll just uh, thank my students and colleagues and collaborators who worked with me on this and also funding agencies and the Wrigley Institute at USC who've all been generous with their support. And I'll stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Is that on? Okay. Hi. So for the first one that you were showing that went over to Spain, how long would that, is that battery powered and how long would it be able to stay out for? Yeah, so the battery, it, there are batteries on board and the batteries on board are used for very limited purposes. They're not used to propel the robot forward. They're only used to drive the computer on board, the sensors on board, which takes limited power. And they're used to move a little ballast mass forward and back just when the vehicle needs to change its pitch. They're also used to power a little pump that changes the buoyancy of the vehicle. And you only need to power those things for small periods of time when you want to rise or when you want to fall. And that's it. And the rest of the, the time, they're not driving a big propeller propelling the vehicle forward. The motion is all buoyancy generated motion. And so that's why a vehicle like this, that vehicle was able to stay in the water for 200 plus days. Um, the vehicles that, you know, the gliders that are deployed from my lab, typically they've kept in the water for two to three weeks at a time. Um, so they're pretty long range, high endurance vehicles. So you can keep them in the water for very long periods of time. It's quite, quite interesting to be able to deploy a robot into the ocean and agree on a rendezvous location where you'll meet it three weeks later. And there are some anxious moments when you go out three weeks later waiting for the robot to pop up. Um, and, and, but it does pop up, and, and so we, we have never lost one. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Vanessa, and I'm a senior at Cabrillo High School, and I have a question. You mentioned traffic jams at sea, and you mentioned the wave patterns, but what about sea life? How, does, how do the gliders navigate sea life? The answer will surprise you. 
we pay no attention to sea life at all. <laughs> For the simple reason that sea life is vastly more intelligent than our robots and stays out of its way. And so these sorts of slow moving gliding vehicles have tended not to attract the attention of any sea predators. And, uh, and so, so the, the robot really is completely unaware of their existence. Um, the robot also moves very, very slowly. And so if, if there is a fairly big sea animal, it's unlikely to, to be in any way damaged. It's far more dexterous at moving around than any, any robot like this. And so that's one other advantage of having these vehicles that are buoyancy driven. They're very sedate in their progress through the water and therefore relatively safe when it comes to, when it comes to sea life. You could, not, you could not be so, you could not, you could not behave in this way if you had a vehicle that was moving much faster or was propelled, then you'd need sensors to actually stay out of the way of sea life. But for these vehicles, they've been safely deployed for weeks on end without any sort of harm to, to, to sea life. Hi, uh, my name is Val, and I'm a longtime volunteer here at the aquarium. My question has to do with the lack of ability to use GPS under the water. What is the obstacle to that, and what is being done to conquer it? Well, the obstacle is basic physics. Radio waves are absorbed by water. And, and uh, we are unlikely to change that fact of life anytime soon. And so, so, you know, that's one reason we also use acoustic communication underwater. So electromagnetic waves that, that move well through vacuum and through air attenuate very sharply in water. And, uh, and, and so it is highly unlikely that you can use space GPS. What you can do is use a sort of sound GPS underwater. So instead of having satellites, you can have transponders that you put on the ocean floor, which emit sound instead of electromagnetic waves. And that can carry over long periods of time. You can get an underwater vehicle to triangulate its position underwater from signals from three or more of these beacons underwater. And such systems have been built. They work pretty well in shallow water, uh, though there are some problems with multiple echoing and things like that. And they're practically pretty difficult to deploy in the deep ocean because it takes a lot of engineering effort to emplace them at the bottom of the ocean and then maintain them successfully. So there's some workarounds, but they're nowhere near, anywhere near as, as robust as we're used to on land. Because nowadays, you know, you whip out a phone and as long as you can see the sky, basically, or even inside your home, the GPS is, is very, very good. There's nothing quite approaching that for, for underwater. There, there's some efforts with acoustics, but they're not, not, not anywhere close. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question here. How, how large are the vehicles? The gliders deployed in my lab are about a meter and a half to two meters long, roughly, uh, depending on how many bays you attach to them. So six to eight feet is a typical length for vehicles like this. The smaller EcoMapper vehicle that I alluded to is a little smaller. It's about four to six feet. Um, and that's a fairly typical form factor for these, these gliders. Are the wings adjustable? They are in many, in many gliders, they are. They can be, they can be oriented at, uh, at a few different angles. No, I meant the swept wing one? No, not, usually not. I was wondering you, mean as in the, you mean the sweep angle, for example? Correct. No. So I don't know if the foil design for swept wing has particular advantages for the water. I can't, I can't say, but at least the ones that are sold commercially tend not to be adjustable for the wing sweep. Yeah. We have one here, here you go. Yeah. What material and what depth does it go? What material and what depth? Yeah, so, so you know, the, the, the the, uh, the gliders are typically made of, uh, of metal, and they go as far down as a kilometer. Parts of the glider are screwed on tightly together with screws, and there are rubber gaskets that stop water from leaking in. But these are basically no plastics. They're all, they're all metal um, and with some highly treated rubber to keep the, to keep the water out. 
Um, and yeah, they can go about a kilometer deep, which is almost a mile, almost a mile. I think we only have time for one more question. You mean from the shore? You can communicate with optical communication with them when they're at the surface, but not when they're below for the same reason that light attenuates in water very sharply. And so, so generally speaking, any electromagnetic means of communication or signaling underwater have very limited utility. Okay, great. We want to give people time to go out and enjoy the robots and meet your favorite robot. Uh, and learn a little about them, and also you can uh, uh, talk to Marav and can ask him other questions one-on-one. -on -one. There will be uh, drinks out there, and we have a, a little raffle. We can always give away three. Let's see. And you come up, last name, Terrell, Neil Terrell. So if you're still here, you'll get free beverage. Uh, Ashley, and I can't read the, the last name on that, but if there's an Ashley. I can remember. And the other one is um, Ariel Hustler. So you can come and get those on your way out there. And I want to say that the next First Wednesday is going to be about ocean sewage. I've, none of you have heard this statistic, but 80% of human sewage is released untreated in the world. And it's not a third world problem. There's a lot of it here. And so we'll have a lecture on that. Uh, we have a robot le lounge after this. I'm not sure what our lounge is going to be after the sewage lecture, but <laughs> we'll let people figure that out. OK, so I want to thank again the speaker. And go out and enjoy yourself and uh, meet a robot.